The Name of the Rose is a 1986 medieval murder mystery directed by Jean-Jacques Annault. Yep, it's based on the book of the same name by Umberto Eco, which came out in 1980. Yeah, I knew I was in for a cerebral <laughs> film as soon as, the, as soon as the film started with the... Uh, where it said, where you would normally have, you know, based on the novel by, it said, uh, a palimpsest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. of the book by uh, Umberto Eco. So I had immediately had to Google that. That's I about you. I was like, what uh, yeah, the hell? I don't know what that was. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's basically something reused or altered, but bearing visible traces of its earlier form. So there you go. I didn't know. I've learned something. So anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a murder mystery, but sort of Sherlock Holmesy, set in medieval Italy in the early 14th century. So we meet William of Baskerville, who's played by Sean Connery, and his little mate Adzo, played by Christian Slater. He's like a little... Uh, Protégé, yeah, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Sean Connery sort of is his mentor. Yeah. They're on their way to a, a, a monastery on a hill. Uh, some sort of, you know, religious church meeting that's going to be happening. So they get there and immediately, well, it's a bit grotty and grimy and grim and everyone's a bit weird. And everyone, a lot of the, a lot of the monks are acting a bit shifty as well. There's obviously something yeah, going yeah, on. Something's not right, yeah. So, uh, you know, we quickly find out that uh, a monk has died. Seemingly by falling from a window that was closed. William de Baskerville gets his uh, Sherlock hat on and starts investigating. <laughs> and then other monks start dying in, in strange and grisly ways. Yeah, strange things are afoot and monks continue to act shiftily and look dirty and be generally unpleasant. <laughs> and then F. Murray Abraham turns up about halfway through the film as an inquisitor, uh, you know, who likes looking for witches and finding the devil in everything. So it's a very convoluted plot. There's a lot going on. It's good to go in, not known. Too much, I guess, because it is a murder mystery. There's shenanigans of the monk variety afoot. There are. <laughs> Whatever that means. Whatever that means. <laughs> the reason we're doing this, if you watched our video last week, um, when we you know, kind of came back again, we this is the one, one of the ones you picked up yeah. in a charity shop. I did, for a pound. For a pound. Yeah. It's one I've actually thought about doing for quite a while. I don't know why. I, I had it on VHS. I don't know why. <laughs> um, I, because I would have probably seen it when I was quite young mm. because it was rated, it's rated 18 and yeah. it was rated 18 back then as well I remember not understanding it not really <laughs> getting it but enjoying it because it's very atmospheric this yeah. film and it feels very authentic I mean from the opening shots you know mm. when they're kind of coming up to the monastery everything's kind of ominous and it's a monastery on a hill and there's lots of mountains around and everything's a bit grey. Everything's and, a bit grey yeah, and dull. Sure. There are some quite beautiful sunsets throughout the mm. film. But you straight away feel quite isolated, as they probably would as well. I'll tell you what it reminded me of. Jabberwocky. <laughs> Remember when we were talking, yeah. we, we did that Jabberwocky, well, quite a while ago now. Yeah, yeah. But that, you know, that's obviously medieval. Yeah. And everything is just filthy yeah. and dirty yeah. and grimy and horrible. Yeah. And that's immediately what came to mind. Yeah, with it. because obviously there are films set in this period that are more glossy, yeah. or more Hollywoodized, should we say. Mm. It was dirty and people were, you know, all the monks, I mean, specifically, I think uh, the director chose ugly people mm. to make them feel like, you know, more realistic. But he really wanted them to stand out. And, and there's, another, there's another French director, um, a guy that made Amelie, he often uses kind of, you know, just people with interesting features, yeah, yeah. big noses or missing teeth or things like that, because it, because it just it kind of stands out, yeah, especially yeah. if you put whack the camera in someone's face. And you put Ron Perlman in there as well, who's, you know, who's quite, got interesting yeah. features, but uh, anyway. uh, not interesting enough for this film because they give him a hunchback and some prosthetics for his face. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's quite as cerebral, actually, as... as as I was, I think the book is a lot more. Yeah, oh so, yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, well, I think, from what I've read, I've yeah, read the book. But from read... what I've read about the book, yeah. I no, mean, I think a lot of people prefer the book, and it's you know a very yeah, highly yeah. regarded book. But... Very highly, yeah. and that's I think there's a lot more philosophizing going on in that book. There's a little bit in the film, but they kind of the film plays out more of, a, as a murder mystery. Yeah. But it's not to say that's not here because there are certainly you know some thought processes going on about. God and religion and what was going on at the time and uh, that's here but it's all it's not too heavy I, no. I didn't think it was I could... think more more sort of the the sort of the whys and wherefores of, of the murder mystery it kind of get a bit tangled at one at some point and it's quite a long film so and I think yeah. it's like one murder is solved but then I think at the end that doesn't really relate to other murders particularly you know that they weren't murdered in the same way and for no. the same reason so 
yeah, I, I, I don't want to tell you too much because spoilers. But, no, um, I mean, Sean Connery, who is amazing in it, by the way, mm. he kind of solves, I mean, he's kind of, and I think in the book as well, he was based on a kind of Sherlock Holmes. Well, I mean, he's, you know, he's got Baskerville in his name. He's got name, Baskerville in, so in his name. Exactly. I think that was an intentional uh, Yeah, thing. yeah, and there is a moment that he actually says elementary he does, yeah. to Adzo, his young <laughs> protege. Um, but he actually solves the murder mystery quite quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. Because I was watching it with my girlfriend, and and she kind of because she's a big fan of murder mysteries, she's a big fan of Agatha Christie and things like that. And as soon as the uh, the denouement happened, that was it for her. She kind of switched off. All oh, right. I said, now it's going on for too long. But then for me, that's when it got interesting. I thought because that's when you start because well they've solved that one, but then somebody else ends up dead. Well, like, there's, oh, there's that. But then there's also why are they. Dying in mm. mysterious ways. What's what's the kind of you know what's the overarching mm. reason for them dying? And that part, that for me was when it, when it got really interesting, and they they start finding. So essentially, without giving too much away, is this giving too much away? I don't think so. They find a library. Yeah. And there are, what Sean Connery realizes is that there are no books in this library, or there aren't that many books mm. in this library. And libraries should have a lot of books, mm. so they want to. They they figure out that perhaps the library is further up in the monastery, in the building itself. And there's an area that they're not allowed. To but they're not allowed to, to access. So they spend uh, the rest of the movie really trying to gain mm. ac- access to this library, and it's what's in that library which is kind of the you know obviously the the uh, why people are dying mysteriously. I mean, you've, you've also got a sort of another subtext going on with you know the poor people outside the walls of the of the monastery yep. you know they're basically just thrown scraps that the monks don't want i think they come and sell things as well don't they food or whatever yeah. they grow yeah yeah but for you know for not very much money i don't think so they're all destitute and living off dirt basically and they're yep. all filthy and i don't think they can speak much the the sort of the monks don't really care you, can, you know they're not really bothered about that whereas william is a is a franciscan and they they do you know they are sort of all about helping the poor you know as a church you know they think that's what the church should be doing is helping these people that that can't help themselves whereas other factions of the church aren't as bothered i mean it's quite interesting when they have when they do all get together and have the you know this sort of meeting you know, the Franciscans are all dressed in drab robes. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I can't remember what faction they're from, but they, you know, they've got all these gowns and yeah, you know, expensive yeah. robes and things. Dripping and in just, jewels. Yeah, so it's yeah. a stark comparison between them. So that you've got all that going on as well. And then, obviously, one of the peasant girls... Well, do we want to spoil that? I, don't, <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of the... Well, I won't go too far into it, but Christian Slater, let's say, has an encounter. <laughs> okay. I mean, it is an 18 because of this encounter, I think. I said on the back of the box it says contains strong sex and nudity and I was like this is about monks <laughs> what, what so yeah so I was quite I was like oh okay it's kind of odd and it kind of comes out of, I don't know if that's in the book I haven't read the book I think it is yeah, yeah. okay all right because it's I mean obviously it's kind of there uh, you know because obviously lust and love mm. specifically lust is something that monks are not supposed to do or feel um, so it's kind of there for that reason, isn't it, to, to, to bring a kind of a conversation about lust and, mm. and love into it. We talked about A Quest for Fire several months ago, and that also directed by Jean-Jacques. You know, he's also got people, you know, rolling around in the dirt in that as well. He has a <laughs> so bit. He likes yeah. filming people he, rolling around in filthy areas. He's certainly... Um, you know, at it, shall yeah. we say. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he's got a penchant for that. Maybe these are the only two films in his catalogue that have that I don't know yeah but he also because he made Seven Years in Tibet yeah. and The Lover I mean I think yeah. The Lover is, is obviously you know about last and, yeah. and everything. I've never seen it myself but uh, I don't know do they roll around in the mud I've no idea I haven't seen I it either know. but <laughs> it doesn't look like the sort of film they would yeah he directed him Enemy at the Gates as well a World War 2 film I think I it's a long time since I've seen that. I can't remember if there's a if there's any uh, you know encounters in that. <laughs> but if there is, you know, it would be in a war zone. So, exactly. Uh, that Ron Perlman as well, didn't it? I th- yeah, I think it did actually. Yeah, yeah. So Ron Perlman was also in uh, Quest for Fire by uh, Jean Jacques Annul, which came out in I think 1980. Which, like you said, we did during our um, prehistoric um, season that we did. He's really great in that, mm. but he's really great here as well. And apparently he wasn't up. So originally they had he cast a dwarf with a large head. Oh right. Um, but he died prior to filming, and the filmmakers said 
because um, I think he Ron Perlman had said, oh, "I want, I need, I want to do this. I really, mm. really want to do this." And the filmmaker said, "Well, the producer said, no, 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 sorry, you need an Italian to do it." So they hired someone else, an Italian actor who was a complete nightmare on set, <laughs> and the director fired him. And then they said, "Okay, well, if he can get on a plane today, he can do it." So he jumped on a plane, obviously, and came over and filmed it. And I think his performance is amazing because he's got such an interesting look about him. But he's one of those actors that can really work with his body, mm. as well as his voice. I mean, in this film, when, when he saw his lines, he kind of asked what, I think he asked what language he speak, spoke. And he said, I think in the book, he speaks lots of different languages. Yeah. So he went away and he translated his lines into six different languages and then like stuck them all yeah, together. Yeah, it's just gibberish so he's all just, the time, isn't it? It's just gibberish. <laughs> and in fact, Sean Connery says at one point, because Adso, Christian Slater, uh, you know, asks him what language are you speaking? And he said... He says all languages and none, which yeah. I think is such a great line because he's literally speaking every you know loads of languages, but they're so bungled together he's mm-hmm. not actually speaking anything. But I just think his performance, and like you say, he's got this hunchback as well, so he's having to act with this quite you know dis- distorted back as well. And he does it so well; he's so convincing, and mm-hmm. he, he's always so convincing. I mean, obviously he did Hellboy, didn't he? Yeah. But especially in this and Quest for Fire, I thought he was just knows how to use his physical body you know mm. as much as his his voice as well and, uh, i think that's what i really liked about this film was its look its setting yeah and things it's got some great quotes there's some great lines i think in the film there's one actually that just comes right near the beginning which is william hickey he's when they first find this monk he's lying face down on on the floor of the, of the chapel in the monastery and he stands up and he says fellow franciscans you must leave this place at once and I was like, that's, where's that? And it's used in a, it's used in a song. Because a lot of, you know, if you grow up listening to certain types of music, then you often find quotes from films mm. or in the music. Uh, and I couldn't, I can't think where it's, so if anyone knows what that, what song used that, I'd love to know because I just... Well, I've they used the line or they actually used the audio? The actual from the audio from oh, the film. Right. They used the audio from the film. Fellow Franciscans, you must... Leave this place at once. It's just a great line, and I think it's got some, yeah, I think it's got some really good um, lines of dialogue yeah. in there. Uh, I probably that's probably why I liked it was because you know I went to Catholic school when I was younger. I'm not a Catholic. I just had to go to a Catholic school for whatever <laughs> reason. I've always questioned religion and mm. faith and everything, but I don't have anything against it personally. I, you know, it's quite an interesting. For what it is, I think it's quite interesting, and all the questioning and the t- uh, talking about it that happens in this film, I, I found that really interesting because mm. I like to, you know, listen to people question such things. So for me, that side of the film, I thought was where it got really exciting, and yeah. and and Sean Connery just being amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, he, you know, his character is very level-headed, and very. you know, he's obviously very intelligent, and he, yeah, he does question stuff, and you know, that he has an argument about, you know, whether Christ laughed. You know, when he was, yeah. oh, it doesn't mention that he did laugh. Well, it doesn't say that he didn't. <laughs> Enjoying yourself and laughing is, you know, is considered sinful. But yeah, I mean, we haven't really, obviously, we've mentioned Christian Slater, but we haven't talked about his performance. I mean, obviously, quite an early role for him. I think he was only about 16 when he made it. Yeah, I mean, complete, I mean, I guess he's sort of, you're almost seeing the film through his eyes. I mean, he does, an older version of him does narrate the end. Well, it narrates a, is there anything in the middle or is it just the start? And the there end? is a little bit more. Can't, oh, remember. can't remember, but no. yeah, you hear, you hear an older voice, and it's obviously him as a you know as an older man. Yeah, I mean, he's sort of just what you know, almost like a deer in the headlights, isn't he? He's sort of wild-eyed yeah. and naive, and and scared of all these strange monks doing weird stuff, and you know, is a creepy place, and he's clearly you know unsettled by it. But Sean Connery's character, William of Baskerville, takes him under his wing, yeah. and he has taken. I think he says, you know, uh, his parents have have entrusted me mm. with him uh, to teach him and to look after him. He does. Com- he does look after him, and there is this. There's a really tender moment actually after the moment we spoke about a while ago. Um, which is which is just really nice between the two of them, and I think he did that in real life as well. I think he kind of, you know, Christian Slater looked up up to him as an actor, yeah. Uh, and so I think you know, both in, in in reality and in the film, he he kind of takes him under under his wing. And I think Christian Slater's great in it. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's, it's, the, the film's a kind of a mixture of, you know, you got German actors and they got French actors and they got British actors in there, and you got American actors. And Christian Slater's not the only American actor in here, so I don't think it kind of because sometimes the accent can sometimes plague it somewhat but I don't think it does here at all obviously Sean Connery is always Scottish no matter yeah. who he plays uh, it doesn't matter if he's a, if he's an Irish policeman in the yeah. Untouchable he still does it in a Scottish accent yeah. so he's always but it doesn't matter because he's such a striking performer mm. and I think what I, I love him in this I, I did wonder if it kind of 
almost paved the way for him uh, to take on the role of Indy's dad in Indiana Jones and the uh, and the Last Crusade because there's similarities, yeah, there, yeah, the kind maybe, of you yeah. know working things out and the religious side of it yeah. as well. Um, and this was kind of he'd had a bit of a career dry, low, yeah, didn't he? a dry yeah. patch, and mm. this was kind of a thing that because again the, the, the producers didn't want Sean Connery, no. and I don't think the writer of the book was very happy that Sean no. Connery got cast, and and then director at first. He was like, no, that's not who I want. But then when he read, he read it. He read some pages, and he was like, oh my god, he's got it perfectly. Yeah. And I think he's really good. I think he's really convincing. He's cheeky. He's a bit sarcastic, which he does so well. You absolutely believe in his performance. Here. You believe he is this this monk mm. that is that, that questions what he's, he is an intellectual. He has been in trouble before. They say later in the film, um, they 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 talk back to an incident where mm. you know he he. He gave judgment, or someone else gave judgment, and he said, "No, I don't. Yeah, I, yeah. Not, I don't agree with that." And he was kind of had up for heresy. Uh, so he is a tricky one in yeah. in in the Franciscan monks. And we learn there's like history between him and and, and F. Murray Abraham's character as well. So immediately there's sort of tension. There's tension two, there, and you can tell straight away that he's a horrible piece of work. <laughs> Horror, but he plays that really well. As yeah, well. he does. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? I, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went with it. I think I need to, you know, because it, it is a, quite a lot to take in. I think I would benefit from another viewing. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, you know, now you know that there's the story in the plot. It's you know, you can you can absorb more. I mean, it's not. I, I was. I mean, it, it does get quite heavy at times, but it also it's it's light hearted as well. Mm. It's not too heavy, and I don't think it takes itself too seriously. There is some lighter hearted moments in there, uh, specifically between Sean Connery and, and Christian Slater. And name another film they worked together. Robin Hood. There we go. See, that was the thing. I was expecting <laughs> uh, uh, Christian Slater to just do his normal accent because that's what he did in Robin Hood. Yeah. And I guess in that, you know, if Robin Hood was American, then there's no point in uh, no <laughs> in anyone else pretending. Late, later films, you know, even when you you know you look at Heather's, which wasn't that many years later. Mm. True Romance, a few years after that, you know, they've got very specific Christian Slater performances. He kind of had, you know, a way of yeah. performing, which is com- is not here at all. Not you at know, all. It's a completely different performance from him, which I hadn't, you know, I hadn't seen before. No, you're so right. Really yeah, he, he kind of goes on to become that rebellious teenager, yeah, yeah. which he's very famous for. But no, here he does do something Cocky different. And sort of, yeah, he's, yeah, he holds it back here, mm. and he does look like he is an innocent, and he is learning. Mm. And, and I think it's really, and maybe that's because it was like, well, I think it was his first, he'd done some TV stuff. His mum was a famous casting yeah. agent, I think, a casting director. He He's kind of, it's like his, his first film, but it, and that kind of helps maybe with his performance, and mm. he is a bit like wide-eyed and... Mm new to everything and uh, yeah I, I, I really enjoyed it and I, I would I would watch it again definitely oh, yeah. I just think yeah for me it looked great there's some really great set pieces and, and when they when they do finally get into this library which isn't a spoiler you know they, they find this amazing labyrinth and it reminded me a little bit of the film labyrinth yeah, actually, yeah, with all, did, the, yeah. all the stairs going leading not sure where they go and everything I'm and not quite sure how that fitted no, in, into that into the building <laughs> but I went with it I went with it yeah exactly <laughs> just go back to the cast because you know we talked about uh, Sean Connery and Christian Slater being in the same film later on but we've got a Bond villain and, we a, have. and a Bond in there yeah, as well yeah. obviously a different Bond but we've got Michael Lonsdale as the abbot yeah, the, uh, of the monastery, and of course, you know, well, Sean was Bond as well. But was he viewed to a kill, Michael Lonsdale? No, he was uh, Moonraker. Oh, Moonraker, sorry, but with Roger Moore. Yeah, so obviously we mentioned the DVD, uh, which we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we so, have any other they Blu-rays? In existence? So I think we were, it's mentioned. been released all all sorts of places. I mean, the US had one. I mean, it seems to be about well, ten ten or so years ago, it came out on Blu-ray all over the place in the US and all over Europe, but right. never in the UK for some reason. Oh, okay. Um, but I think a lot of those are now out of print. The US one is definitely is, and it's quite expensive now. I think the only one that's really you know you can pick up for a reasonable price is the Scandinavian edition, right. which is basically the same disc, you know, apart from maybe some language differences. It is English friendly. Um, it's all you know. It's region free, so um, but I had a quick look on eBay and you get it for sort of between ten and fifteen pounds. So right. okay. um, that's not too bad. I mean, I don't think the picture is amazing. Obviously, better than than the DVD, but it's and I think it is quite a grimy and dirty film anyway. So it's never going to look amazing. I'm sure they could probably clean it up a bit with a restoration. But whether it's a film that ever would get that, I don't know. I mean, it's not exactly unknown. No, I mean, um, I, and I mentioned, I think I, I mentioned it during Quest for Fire. There was a, it was a TV remake. There was, yeah, yeah. Um, was that a British remake? Or no, was it a 
I'm not sure. I mean, it's got John Turturro in it That's right. as, as William of Baskerville. Now, I'm not sure what, what, you know, where that was made. This is the thing. You know, the film is, is just over two hours. It can't fit everything from the book in it. No, of course not. The TV series, I don't know how many episodes it is, but obviously I would imagine it's probably, I don't know, six or so. So I think it probably, from what I've read, maybe adds some plot threads in there that aren't in the book. Oh, on the film. So, oh, no, under the book. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, no, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, so I don't quote me on that. I mean, but, I mean the book sounded quite interesting. Uh, I'd be quite interested to read it. Um, it was obviously structured differently to the film. Uh, the book, I think, was it sounds like it was structured over seven days, and then within those seven days, it, the, the, the plot happens within the hours that the monks pray. Because, um, of course, in those days, you know, I mean, we, you know, we was, I think we've spoken about this before during another film that we did, oh, with maybe Anne of a Thousand Days. Right, yeah. You know, obviously, in these days, you know, religion was everything. Mm. Obviously, you know, you, you would not to go against it because otherwise you would find yourself at the hands of an inquisitor or, or someone like that uh, and your head on a stake. It was a horrific time mm. to live, you know. It was dirty, it was grimy, unless you were lucky. But religion is what ruled the day. And obviously, the, the you know, countries were governed by religion. Yeah, yeah. Unlike, you know, not that most of us aren't these days. I think that, you know, the book obviously sounds like it's structured more around that side of it, mm. um, which the film not so much. It's a shame, actually, that this doesn't have the, the Drew Struzan poster as the, as the cover. It's not yeah. particularly, it looks sort of a blurry, out of focus photo <laughs> of Sean Connery. <laughs> so they could have tried a bit harder with that. But yeah, there's a lovely Drew it's Struzan lovely poster. poster. Yeah, for the, for the original theatrical release. So I don't know, maybe it'll get a re release as it obviously is out of print in a lot of places, but shame that it's not more widely available. I couldn't really, I mean, it, it's Warner, so they're, they're one of the few years that don't have their own streaming service yet. So right. um, maybe yeah, yeah. maybe when they do, they'll chuck it on there. We don't really need another streaming service, so I'm always hoping they don't. <laughs> so I think we've got enough of those now.